Hi, I'm Michael Correa, and this is Psych Exam Review. This video is part of a series on how you can study more effectively. And in this video, we're going to focus on taking notes. So we're going to start with the same guiding principle that I introduced in the previous video on active retrieval. This is the idea that we're going to see our mind as the primary source. And everything else will be secondary. So we're going to apply this to the process of taking notes. So textbooks, PowerPoint slides, worksheets, all of that is secondary. We're going to try to create our notes using our mind, and then we'll only go to those when we have difficulty or when we need some assistance. And so this introduces a desirable difficulty. So that's something that's hard to do in the moment, but it's better for your learning over the long term. And so in this case, it's going to be harder to take notes this way. It's going to be a bit slower. Uh, you might have to stop a bit more often, but you're going to find, hopefully, that you don't have to review the notes as much in the future. So what we're doing is we're making the note taking process part of the learning process. So often students think of taking notes as something you do, and then you learn the material later, right? You just need to get the notes first, and uh, you worry about actually learning the information later on. But we're going to say, try to learn as much of the information as you can while you're taking notes, and then you won't need to review as much in the future. So I'm going to go through this process for taking notes from readings, like textbooks, and then I'll talk about some of the unique challenges that come from taking notes from lecture. But in both cases, I'm not going to give you a specific list of rules of exactly how you should format your notes. This is not about formatting, you know, whether you should put things in the margins or use bullet points or how much space should you leave or how should you label things. That's really up to you. And uh, there's going to be some individual preferences. But the main focus is using your mind. If you're doing that, then exactly what the notes look like shouldn't really be all that relevant. You know, if you like to include some little drawings or you like to draw little, uh, you know, diagrams, uh, that's fine. Maybe you find that helpful. But if you don't, then I'm not going to make some sort of uh, rule and say you have to take notes this way. I'm going to say take notes using your mind. However you want to do that is up to you. Okay, so the general concepts that we need is first we need to answer some questions before we take notes. And the first thing you need to know the answer to is what are you looking for from this material? And this means you have to have a goal. And you want to have this before you start reading. And the reason is it's going to influence your perception of what you're reading. If you already know what you're looking for, it's much easier to find it. It will stand out to you. It will announce itself. Say, here's the thing that you said you're looking for. You know, if you're looking for the main concepts, then when you're reading in the textbook and suddenly you see, oh, hey, there's a main concept. That's something I need to know. Right? So sometimes what you're looking for is very basic. You know, at the lowest level, you might say, I'm just looking for one thing from this entire text. You know, if it's something you're reading for enjoyment, then the thing you're looking for is just, am I enjoying it? Yes or no? If I'm not enjoying it, maybe I stop reading. If I am, I continue. And so uh, on the lowest level, what you're looking for is just one thing to get out of this text. I'm going to get something out of this text. Maybe it's just enjoyment. Or I'm going to learn one thing. I'm going to learn one main idea from this book. You know, if it's less than one thing, if you don't have anything you want to get out of it, then you don't bother reading it at all. But you'll generally have at least one thing you want to get out of a text, all the way up to the highest level where you'd have like everything. And so we can think about moving our way up. Maybe I just want to get the main concepts. Say, okay, this reading, I need the main ideas, and that's it. If I get those, I'm happy. Maybe say, oh, actually for this you know, class I'm taking, I don't just need the main ideas. I need to also know the exact examples. So maybe I need to know the theories, but I also need to know the research that they're based on. I have to have some general idea of the studies that were involved. And then maybe higher than that, you say, well, actually, I need to know specific facts and figures from those studies. I need to know the percentages. I need to know exactly how a variable was defined in the study. Okay, so that's going to be uh, even more detailed. And then, as I said, all the way up to the highest level, and this is where you can become what uh, Mortimer Adler calls a peer of the author. And I really like uh, this phrase for this idea that you understand everything about the argument, every part of the you know, idea in as much detail as the author. And this is something that uh, Mortimer Adler talks about in his book, How to Read a Book. I uh, highly recommend this if you want to think about this very detailed process. Now, you're not going to do this for most readings. Becoming a peer of the author is very difficult and time consuming, and you have to really engage. And so you're only going to do this for select situations. You're not going to do this if you're reading something like a textbook, because you know in a one semester course or even a year long course, you really aren't going to become a peer of the author of you know an 800 or 900 page textbook. It's just not going to be possible. In fact, the author of the textbook is probably not a peer of the author for all the studies that they mention because the amount of time and detail that it would take to engage with that is, you know, pretty much impossible to actually do. You know, they need to be uh, an, an expert in all of the nuance of all of the ideas in the entire field and nobody can do that. Uh, that's part of why we have specialization in uh, you know, academic fields. It's because you can't become 
appear of the author on everything. But in select cases, you might want to have this be your goal. So I'm really going to understand this in as much detail as possible. And then that's going to help you to figure out what kind of notes you need. And so that next question is, okay, based on my goal, what I need to get out of this text, what should my notes look like? What kind of notes do I need? Now, at the lowest level, if you want one thing from a book, the answer might be, I don't need notes at all. You know, if I watch a movie and I want to get enjoyment from the film, I don't take any notes after because I got what I wanted. And if my friend asks me a week later, hey, how was that movie? I can, you know, sort of give a, yeah, I liked it. You should see it. Or no, I didn't. And that's it. I don't need to check my notes for that. So at the lowest level, don't need notes at all. And then, of course, all the way up to the highest level, my notes need to include everything. And actually, it turns out this highest level is pretty much never going to be the case. Because at the highest level, if your notes include everything that the text includes, the exact wording of the author for every sentence, then you just have a copy of the text. And so generally, you're not going to create notes that look like this. This should really, uh, oops, use another color here. Um, this should really never happen. You know, this level of detail. And if you're in a situation where you need this level of detail here, then you know you could just take a picture of the pages of the book and you'd have an exact copy of everything that's in there. But that's not really notes, right? Generally, your notes are going to condense and summarize things at least to some degree. Now, maybe at the highest level, uh, you know, you don't need every single sentence, but only certain sentences that the author uses that you want to make sure you can analyze, you know, and you need to have the exact wording. But you know, if you're reading a textbook or something, you're almost never going to need that. Okay, so this relates now to that next uh, question that we have, which is how dense is the content? What your notes are going to look like is going to depend on what your goal is, how much detail you need in those notes, and then the density of the content. So what this is going to help you to address is the question of how often do I need to stop when I'm reading? And you want to know uh, the answer to this uh, before you start taking notes. So you want to think about, okay, Am I going to be stopping at the level of the book? I read the entire book and then I write down some of my thoughts. All right. In that case, maybe the content is not so dense. I can keep track of all the main things that are happening as I'm going. Or if you're reading a novel, you know, I often I would recommend read the novel straight through as much as possible. If you're stopping, you know, too often to write down some notes, you kind of lose track of the process, the sort of enjoyment, especially if you're reading something like a play. Try to go through it all at once, and then you can always go back, right? You can always uh, go back through it and check for details. But you know, if you're reading maybe the entire book before you stop. But if you're reading a textbook, of course, you're not going to do that. You're not, I'm not going to recommend you read the entire textbook cover to cover before you stop and take some notes. So, or maybe at a play, you know, maybe you stop at the level of an act, you know, like an intermission. You sort of stop. Okay, what happened there? What do I predict is going to happen in the next act? Maybe give a, give it a little thought before you go into it. Uh, or maybe sometimes you're going to stop at the level of the chapter. Or, I mean, if you're reading a really long book, you might stop in sections because it just takes too long to read the whole thing uh, from cover to cover. But uh, you might stop at the chapter level. Okay, uh, that's a point where I can stop, think about the main ideas that were presented, or think about what happened in that chapter. If you're reading a textbook, you might be stopping more often. Maybe uh, you're stopping at the level of the page, right? Because textbooks are more dense, and so there's going to be a lot more information over the course of a page, and you might need to stop and say, okay, what were all the content? Yeah, you know, what, what were all the concepts that were covered on just this page? Maybe I should stop here and write some of them down. Uh, and then, of course, if it gets really dense, you might be stopping at the paragraph level. You say, okay, I just read this paragraph and there was a lot going on. There were like four or five new terms, and there was you know an exact uh, description of something that I think I'm going to need to know for the test. So I should stop here and get some notes on this. Uh, and then at the highest level, again, we're down to the sentence level. We're down to the exact wording that the authors used. There might be times where it's very dense. It's very important. You have to pay attention to exactly how a particular word was used in a sentence. And in that case, after you read that sentence, you, okay, this, I, I need to stop here and make sure I get this. This is like a key idea in this text summarized into one sentence. I want to make sure I get it. So in that case, I might stop more often. Now, of course, you won't be stopping every single sentence in a text, right? You shouldn't be, in that case, it's just, much too dense. Um, but you can think about this. And then the important point here is this is going to vary throughout the text. Okay, Most texts have different density levels as you read through them. So if you're reading a, a textbook, sometimes they might have a page that's just kind of a uh, real life example, right? A current event 
here's how you can see this theory in action in the real world. And so in that case, you might think, okay, I'm not going to be tested on this. This is just an example. This is just a story to help me to remember it or to give uh, some context. And so in that case, you might read a whole page without any notes and say, you know what? I'm not going to be asked about, you know, this guy's name, or I'm not going to be asked, you know, oh, this happened in August. Uh, you know, that's an irrelevant detail. Whereas for other sections, you know, on the next page, maybe you get a description of a study and you say, oh, here I do have to know those fine level details. And so I might stop after a paragraph, whereas before maybe I went through a few pages without stopping. Uh, okay, so you want to think about that. You want to be paying attention to how dense the content is, and that's going to be related to the goal that you have for what you want to get out of the reading. And then uh, the last point here, when you're taking notes from uh, readings and especially textbook readings, you want to remember that there's already a number of secondary backups that already exist. And your goal in taking notes is not to just recreate these. You want to use the existing backups, don't recreate them. So what are some existing backups that you should think about using? Often students don't think about this, but one of them is the table of contents. If you're reading a textbook, you know, uh, the table of contents provides you with an overview of all the main concepts that are presented in the chapter. And that means you don't necessarily have to be duplicating that in your notes. So for example, if I'm reading a chapter, you know, if I were reading something I'm already maybe a little bit familiar with, I read the chapter in the textbook. And then if I go to the table of contents, you can see you know, in this textbook, it has a summary of what was presented in that chapter. It's a very basic outline. So after I read the chapter, and even maybe before I take my notes, I might look at this and say, okay, this chapter on uh, cognitive and language development. The first section was uh, why studying development is important. Okay, can I answer that? Can I? What, why did it say that studying development was important? Okay, uh, you know, later sections, the brain. Okay, what do I remember about cognitive development and the brain? Or Piaget's theory. Do I remember Piaget's theory? Which one was that? What were the stages? Vygotsky's theory. Okay, what do I remember about that? So this can be a way that I can force myself to use my mind uh, where I'm not even using my own notes. I'm just using an existing backup that's already here. And then related to that is you can use an index. So you shouldn't be in your notes copying down exact definitions of terms, right? That's not really necessary. Maybe I write down a term that I come across. Oh, this term seems important. Later when I look at my notes, I want to test myself on that term. But I don't need to copy out the full definition by hand because if I look in the index of the book, you know, I can find it. So as long as I have the term somewhere, I can read through my notes and say, oh, I don't remember what that term meant. I'm sort of testing myself. I'm relying on my mind. And if I can't come up with the answer, it's not like, oh no, what do I do? It's, well, it's here in the index of the book. So I can look it up later. And I don't need to have, you know, taken the time to write it out by hand, exactly word for word, what was in the textbook. Because I still have the textbook. I can go back to it. Uh, another way you can do this is through the chapter summaries that exist in a lot of textbooks. And so to give you an example of this, I can show you uh, from uh, my own textbook, Master Introductory Psychology, if we look at this, uh, we can see at the end of each chapter, you know, there's a little mini summary. It's just the key ideas from the chapter, but you can use this. So uh, for example, if you look at the, the biology chapter here, we have this little summary, you know, neurons are the building blocks of the nervous system, which communicate with one another. This communication consists of two parts, action potentials within a neuron and chemical messages passed in the synapses between neurons by neurotransmitters. Okay, so it sort of gives you, okay, that was one of the main ideas that you should definitely understand from this chapter. And then you can use that to test yourself. Okay, I need to know about neurons. Hmm, do I remember the parts of a neuron? Okay, I need to know about action potentials. Do I remember how does an action potential occur? What is this and how does it happen? Oh, I need to know about uh, communication between neurons. How does that process happen? What are the, some of the things I need to know? What is the terminology? What are some examples? Maybe I need to know some neurotransmitters. And so you can use that as a starting point uh, and that means you don't need to necessarily have written all that out in your notes in great detail as you were reading. You can go at the end, look back, say, okay, do I remember these main ideas? You can test yourself from that. And then if you don't have uh, the ability to come up with some of that, then you can go back into the text. Maybe you write some more detail in your notes than you had before. Okay, so this gives us sort of a three-step process to taking notes. The first is we read a section based on our goal. And the section here could be as long as the entire book, or it could be a chapter, or it could be a paragraph, or it could be a sentence, right? So we read a section, and then we create notes based on the amount of detail that we need for that section. Now, I use the term create intentionally here, right? I like to think about creating notes, not just taking notes. I know the video title is how to take notes, but really you should create notes. And the difference is often when you take notes, you're just taking them from the material. 
right? There's the definition. I'm copying it into my notebook. I'm taking it from here and putting it here. But if you're creating a note, you've already read it in the book and you're trying to come up with it on your own. And then if you need to, you can refer back. So the third step is just to check on the notes and you won't always need to do this. Sometimes you'll read a section, you'll write down some of the key ideas and you'll say, you know, I think I got it. You know, I understood everything. It wasn't uh, too hard. I can refer back, just double check. Oh, did I, this new term, did I spell that correctly? Cause I, I don't want to, you know, uh, learn it wrong from my notes. Okay. Yeah, I have that. Oh, I didn't skip anything. Okay. I'm good. I have uh, detailed notes that I can refer back to when I need them. All right. So those are the three steps you read based on what your goal is. You stop and try to come up with it on your own. And then you refer back if necessary. And then the next two parts I'm going to talk about in future videos. And these are the sort of the follow-ups to this. One of these is when will you return to the concepts? Often students take notes and then they don't look at them for a month. And it's like, you know, that's, that's not a good idea. You want to make sure you have a plan for when you're going to return to those. And I'm going to talk about spacing in the next video, but two things that you can think about while you're taking notes. One is the difficulty of creating those notes. If it was really hard for you to remember the ideas that you read and you had to refer back quite often, then that's a sign you're probably gonna have to review these concepts more regularly. They're complex, uh, they're difficult for you. And so that means you probably wanna come back maybe tomorrow. You wanna look this over to see, because a lot of it will probably be forgotten by tomorrow you know, or, or within a few days. If it was very easy, then you might not need to return to it immediately. Say, like, okay, yeah, I got everything. I was able to remember it after reading just once. I wrote it down, maybe next week I'll look at it again. So the difficulty will determine when you should return. And then related to that is the density. Something might've been easy, but if it was very dense, there's a lot of details, then you'll have to return to it more often. So if you say, wow, you know, I have pages and pages of notes on this chapter and I think it's all stuff I need to know, even though I understood it when I read it, there's just a lot. So I'm gonna to need to come back to this over and over again. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to it sooner rather than waiting two weeks when I've forgotten, you know, 75% uh, of it. Okay, and then the other follow-up thing to think about is will you make repeated passes through these notes? Now you won't always do this, but especially if you're using multiple sources, uh, then you wanna make repeated passes through your notes on a particular source. Okay, so what do I mean by this? What you're really doing is you're looking for new connections that you might not have initially when you read it. So if, if you're reading, let's say a novel, you take some notes on the novel, some you know motifs, maybe some uh, major events, some of the character names, things like this. Uh, later, let's say in the class, later in the semester, you've read another uh, work from the same time period or another work by the same author or something, you might want to go back to those first notes and make another pass through because you'll see connections that you didn't see before and you want to write them down. You want to make note of it. Maybe at the end of the semester, you're going to write a paper on, you know, this particular author on, on this, you know, time period. And so by going back through the, that first work you read, you, you couldn't create those notes the first time because you didn't have those ideas yet. And so if you just go back to your notes at the end of the semester and you just have the stuff from the, the first uh, work that you read, you might not have uh, maybe some of those connections you thought of, you've already forgotten them. So you wanna go back through the notes, look for new connections. And so here I can show you an example. This is what I do when I create these videos. You know, I, I have some ideas of what I wanna talk about. And you know, things I've read from, you know, educational psychology research and, you know, books on the topic of learning. And so I, I sort of create an outline and then I go through this multiple times. You know, and actually this isn't even uh, the, you know, uh, this is the, not the first draft of these notes, you know, uh, for this video. So I go through, I write down the main ideas. I think about, okay, how am I going to organize this? And then a few days later, I go back through it. I look at the notes again and I add things in. Oh, I, you know, here's another example. I didn't think of this the other day when I created the notes or, oh, I read something new since then. And now I can add it in, you know, refer to this other example. Uh, and so I go through them multiple times. And what this helps me to do is find new connections and new ideas that I wasn't able to create at the time that I first made the notes. Uh, and you can do this also for textbooks. You know, if you go back through your notes on the textbook, maybe something that the professor said in class will suddenly, oh, you know, here's the example the professor gave in class that I didn't know when I took notes on the textbook. So you wanna think about whether you're gonna make repeated passes and how frequently you're gonna do that. Okay, and now we get to the special challenges of lecture. So there's an old joke about lecture that uh, lecture is a way to pass information from the professor's notes to the student's notes without going through the minds of either. And unfortunately, this is kind of true, right? It's easy for professors to lecture mindlessly, you know, just read off some PowerPoint slides, put things up and uh, sort of just go through them very quickly without really thinking about them. And of course, it's also the case that students can mindlessly copy things on the PowerPoint without really thinking about what's being presented to them. 
And so we want to avoid that tendency. We want to make sure the main focus in your lecture is you're thinking about the ideas. You're using your mind, right? That's the, the guiding principle we're going to come back to every time here is use your mind. This principle is, is the most important idea. If you're not using your mind in lecture and you're mostly just using your hand and writing out the notes, then you're not getting the most out of it. But there are some additional challenges to lecture that we have to keep in mind. And two of these main challenges are, first, it's hard to know the density of material in advance. When a professor starts telling you a story, you don't know where it's going. And it's, you know, it's a little more obvious sometimes in a textbook. Oh, this little box of information is like an example, uh, and it's not a key idea. But when the professor starts telling you a story, you don't know. Do I need to know the details of this story, or is this just you know, rambling and, and not really that relevant? And it's hard to know what the density is. How much do I need to get out of what the professor is saying right now? Should I be writing down every other word, or do I need you know, one sentence that will summarize it? Or maybe I don't even need it at all. So it's hard to know that when the professor is speaking. And then related to that is also the speed is going to change. You know, you can slow down your own reading when things get difficult. You can't easily slow down the professor's lecture. But you do have a way. And this is one of the solutions to this is to think about the, the one sort of tool you have to slow things down is to ask questions and to ask for clarification. And this is part of why we have lectures where students can interrupt. You can raise your hand. You can stop the professor and say, Sorry, could you explain that again? Now, of course, this will vary. Some professors are more open to this. I mean, they should all be uh, hopefully open to providing clarification and making sure that students understand what they're presenting. Uh, but it might not always be the case. Maybe you're just watching a lecture where uh, it's not open to Q&A, or maybe it's not open until the end. And so you might want to take a note on, I want to make sure I ask about that. I didn't get it. Maybe I put a question mark here. So you want to ask questions if possible. That's one way you can try to adjust the speed of the lecture and the density of the material. Um, and then uh, another challenge that you might have is whether or not there are existing backups for the lecture. When you're reading a textbook, of course, you have the textbook. You know that you can always go back to it, and it's not going to change, right? When, you know, tomorrow, when the textbook, there, you know, the information that you read today will still be there. But for a lecture. You want to think about that in advance, and that should influence the type of notes that you take. You know, if it's a video lecture, then you can do the same process I described for reading. You can watch the whole video or watch you know, a certain section, stop the video, and write down some ideas, write some notes. If it's in person, maybe you can't do that, but maybe it's being recorded. And if you know it's being recorded, then you say, okay, I'm going to mostly focus on listening and maybe asking some questions, but I'm not going to write down everything because I can do that later with the video if I need to. At the end of class, uh, I can stop. For five minutes, and this I, I do recommend you do the same process. You know, after write things down. Often, you know, in, in school settings, class ends, everybody rushes out, and like all the information rushes out of your mind too. Uh, instead of stopping for five minutes and writing things down. Now, again, ideally, you could have uh, a teacher or professor who stops, you know, a few minutes before the end of class and gives you time to do this. But often that won't be the case. Um, but if there's an existing backup, uh, you can rely on that, or you can create your own. You know, and maybe it's as simple as just taking an audio recording with your cell phone, right? You can uh, record that. Now, a lot of times you might not need to go back to it. You might say, okay, yeah, the professor rambled on for 20 minutes and uh, I don't need to review that because it, it turns out that story was kind of pointless uh, now that I, I know what it was about. But at the time you didn't know that. So if you have the audio recording, if you then later say, oh yeah, the, you know, actually the details there were really relevant or interesting or they're going to relate to the paper I'm writing. You know, maybe you go to office hours and ask some more clarification and get some more detail, or you find another source that might have it. You know, the, the other backups could be, you know, other books or other materials, or you could just have an audio recording. So, okay, I can at least follow now what the professor was talking about. That at the time I wasn't sure. Uh, and so, for your notes from lecture, you want to at least have an outline right, of the key ideas, and then depending on you know, these other circumstances, what backups were available, whether you can stop and ask questions, you can try to fill in the details later. And sometimes, you know, if the professor is going really fast and maybe all you get is the main idea, if you know you're going to have a few minutes at the end for questions, you can stop then and say, okay, could you explain this again, right? And that's when you can fill in some of the details because you might not be able to get all the details in the moment. Uh, okay, so uh, let's now end by thinking about some things you can reflect on. Uh, one is, how are you currently taking and using your notes? What's your process look like? You know, Are you mostly mindlessly copying from the book or mindlessly copying from the PowerPoint slides? 
Uh, actually, that's another existing backup I didn't mention for lecture. You know, often the professor will give you the slides. That means you don't need to copy that all down. You should focus on, you know, listening to the explanation if that's the case. Uh, often students just copy the text on the slides and they're not really listening to what the professor is saying. When you have a backup of the text, what you don't have a backup of is what the professor is saying in the moment. Uh, okay, so how are you taking notes? How are you using your notes after you take them? Do you take them and then never go back to them until the day before the test? That's probably not going to be ideal. And where is your mind during the process? Is it mostly focused on, you know, writing notes in lecture rather than listening? When you're reading a textbook, is your mind mostly on the words on the page in the textbook rather than thinking about the ideas? And how can you adjust that to make it more efficient? And then the assignment here is to try to do this for this video. You know, I've been uh, talking about a bunch of different ideas. Think about how many you could remember if you sat down with a blank sheet of paper and you just try to remember, okay, what were the three steps for, you know, taking notes that were suggested? Or what were the challenges of lecture that I should keep in mind? Or what are the questions I should know the answer to before I start reading something? So see if you can come up with those main ideas from this video uh, right now as sort of notes. And you can, of course, always go back and rewatch the video. You can fill in more detail if you're missing something. And then lastly, I'd like you to share some of your experiences with taking notes. Do you have some tips for how you take notes? Maybe you have a strategy that you use, especially for a lecture. So uh, I'm uh, not taking notes in lecture nearly as much as I used to be when I was a student. Uh, so mostly my notes come from readings that I'm doing. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on how you go about doing that, some things you recommend or things that maybe haven't worked well for you or difficulties that you have that maybe I can address in future videos. And then also if you have any suggestions for how you use your notes later, because uh, that's what we're going to start talking about in some future videos. So I hope you found this helpful. If so, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. And I look forward to hearing from some of you in the comments. Thanks for watching.